Hello everyone and welcome to my second ADAPT live talk. For those of you that don't know me from the first time, I am Elena Groß. I have come to the end of my PhD in clinical research now and um, in the meantime and I've just finished writing with my colleagues a Nature Neurology review on metabolism and migraine and potential metabolic treatment options which I would love to talk to you about today. So um, yeah, the deadline was yesterday and I'm, my brain is still very sleep deprived, I would say. So if I'm a little slow today, please forgive me and uh, I will still give it my best. And what I find very exciting is that even in the brief time from the last time we talked, which is about a year ago, to today, the acceptance and the interest in this issue has increased quite a lot. And I find this very exciting. There's more and more research being published on this matter. And uh, before I get more into this topic, uh, just a very quick disclaimer. I'm a research scientist, I'm not a medical doctor, and I don't intend to play one on the internet, so any information I will provide you with today is for informational purpose only. Okay, just uh, maybe very briefly a bit about myself, so those of you that haven't seen me in the first time round know who they're listening to. I grew up in Germany, and I still remember the first time I got in touch with migraines, which was when I was about five. I was watching uh, with my neighbors a very famous uh, children movie called Pünktchen and Anton. The Germans and Austrians am amongst you might know it. And uh, there the protagonist's mother has migraines. And when Anton asks, what are migraines? The explanation given is that migraines are headaches that don't exist. So for the next 10 years, I was believing this definition a migraine being a headache that doesn't actually exist until about really 10 years later I found out that migraines do very much exist and um, yeah I got them around one year after I started the oral contraception or maybe half a year later around 15 and uh, we were going to one doctor after the other and it took quite a quite some time about a year to get a final diagnosis and then I discovered that really we don't actually or at that time we didn't actually know what a migraine was or what we can do against it and all the pharmacological agents back then were borrowed from other diseases like antidepressants, anti-epileptics, beta blockers. And so within the next 10 years, I'd say I'd try any pharmacological option that there was and also all the alternative um, treatments like acupuncture and those kind of things. But I was really only getting worse. And uh, towards the end of my degree of psychology, um, I had chronic migraines and uh, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to do a normal job anyway so I decided I'll try and get into neuroscience to potentially within my lifespan understand more about what is happening in the migraine brain what is a migraine and what can we potentially do to prevent them and uh, then I went into neuroscience and towards the end of my degree I stumbled across something that had cha would change my life forever after and that was the ketogenic diet so ketosis as the oldest treatment for epilepsy kind of a fasting mimicking diet that had worked for epilepsy and uh, the implications, the potential mechanisms were so migraine relevant that I knew that this was a solution and that this was something that I would want to study in my PhD. And after a lot of trials and error and self-experimentation and uh, yeah, a lot of grand writing, I was finally able to do that in my PhD in Basel and this is where I'm still today. And, um, and yeah, so the last weeks or even months I have been digging into the existing research in much more de detail than before and I was really quite positively surprised about how much research on migraine metabolism, mitochondrial functioning and migraine already exists. And a lot of it is actually like 30, 50, even 80 years old. So it's been old and then kind of forgotten about. And for example, already in 1935, migraines were referred to as the hypoglycemic headache. Hypoglycemia meaning low blood sugar headaches, okay? And, uh, and then research had shifted towards more genetic mechanisms, vasculature, especially neurovasculature, excitability. And uh, nobody for quite some time has actually ever really talked about migraine being potentially also a metabolic problem rather than a neurological problem or maybe even at some point a psychological problem. Okay, but if we look at migraine, very similar to a lot of other diseases, susceptibility to migraine is determined by genetic factors and therefore it's subject to the forces of natural selection, right? So you might remember that from your biology back then during A-levels. So it's fairly unlikely that 
that a disease that is as common as migraine with 15%, so 1 billion worldwide being affected, does not confer any evolutionary advantage or put differently the common polymorphisms, right? The gene variants that underlie migraine do not confer any evolutionary advantage. So one could say, or one could hypothesize that a migraine prone nervous system may be, or at least have been, associated with a reproductive or survival advantage. And this then raises the next question, has our environment become inadequate or suboptimal for the genetic migraine composition, let's say? And one of the factors that has drastically changed within the last 10,000 years is nutrition. Of course, there have been other changes, but uh, we will focus on this one now. The agricultural revolution basically ensured that one macronutrient was constantly available to us. And that was very new, carbohydrates, all year round. So a very recent study that I got quite excited about in Drosophila still, Drosophila being fruit, fry, flu, fruit fly, sorry, showed that depending on the genotype that was in that given Drosophila, a mitochondrial DNA, so mitochondria, you might remember, are the powerhouses of the cell, and they have their own DNA. And that DNA is, we will talk about this later, is very susceptible to oxidative stress or, or other insults because it doesn't have such extensive repair mechanisms as uh, nuclear DNA has. And some nuclear DNA also, um, basically some nuclear DNA is responsible for making mitochondrial um, mitochondrial proteins, but this mitochondrial DNA has several, there are several types called haplotypes of different mitochondrial DNA groups. Well, basically, we can just say that depending on the mitochondrial DNA you have, you can either metabolize carbohydrates well or not so well, or basically the composition of your diet that is best for a given organism, to some extent, depends on mitochondrial DNA or the mitochondrial genotype. And I think this is very, very exciting because it's the first link between uh, our mitochondria, our powerhouses, saying that they will only work optimally if we give it the right fuel. So with, with some mitochondrial variations, you may be able to metabolize carbohydrates differently or better than with other, uh, than with other mitochondrial DNA. And this would have implications for almost any disease such as migraine. Okay, so I would love to spend the next, let's say, 15 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes, to briefly highlight the abnormalities in uh, migraine energy metabolism that have been found and also uh, what kind of experimental data exists that gives us a link or that helps us link the initial trigger factor of migraine to the headache generation and the re resolution of the attack. And this ideally would help us um, support our hypothesis that migraines confer, act, actually confer or did confer an evolutionary advantage and that today the migraineurs are really just mal or not, not optimally um, adapted to the current living conditions, to our current environment. And, this, and one, nutrition is one factor of this, but there's also a lot of other factors like um, uh, pollutants, toxins, you know, then uh, artificial lights and stress at work, you know, not moving and other things that will have an impact. But today the focus will be mostly on nutrition. Okay, so, and then of course, finally, we will also talk about potential treatments of that target this cerebral brain uh, metabolism and uh, mitochondrial functioning in migraine, but also other diseases. And if we have the time, we can also compare mitochondrial functioning or other adaptive potentially adaptive mechanisms like insulin resistant with other diseases okay so the principles we'll be discussing they are not only specific to migraine but they will translate to other diseases as well probably okay but migraine specific is when we try and answer the question of what causes a migraine or what is a migraine it's always nice to look at the start of the tech which is the migraine trigger factors and uh, for those of you that know migraineurs, have migraines themselves or in their family, they know that uh, there is a lot of triggers that can directly be linked to energy metabolism. And there's others that are not so directly linked to metabolism. But actually we found, or even others before us have found that any common migraine trigger 
can be associated with increases in oxidative stress. And oxidative stress, we know that these free radical, reactive oxygen species, short ROS, they will impact mitochondrial functioning, amongst other things. They will cause inflammation and they play a role in a lot of given diseases. And um, so, for example, we know that fasting, skipping a meal triggers a migraine, so this can be linked to hypermetabolism. Then stress, mentally and physically, like exercise, increases oxidative stress. Sleep changes are associated with oxy oxygen, uh, ox <laughs> uh, ROS increases and hormonal changes, including the oral contraceptive. So that's something very few uh, people actually know, but there are studies showing that if women take oral contraceptives, their oxidative stress levels increase by as much as 50% on average, right? So this is, uh, this is huge. So of course, if you then have a migraine genotype with not so well working mitochondria, then this might be enough to trigger migraine. And actually in the patients that I saw, those that have been taking the oral contraceptive pill, especially the mixed pill, the start or the worsening of the migraine usually correlates very well with, take, with onset of pill taking, about half a year to a year later, as it was the case in my, uh, in my example. And then also sensory triggers, olfactory, visual, auditory, especially blue lights, right? Very intense lights, uh, loud noises, but also perfumes that have chemicals in them that directly go into the brain via the nose. They can all increase oxidative stress. So this is a link on how sensory triggers can actually trigger a migraine in somebody who's vulnerable. And weather changes even. If uh, the weather changes and we have uh, differences in pressure, then we, we also get differences in oxygen content in the air and also differences in potential pollutants. And again, this can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. Oxygen shortages will lead to less ATP being produced. And uh, again, there's a link to metabolism and migraines. And then there's been a lot of biochemical evidence that also points towards migraine being a problem with energy metabolism. For example, with new neuroimaging techniques, one is called MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, you can actually measure ATP in the brain. And these studies shown, showed really hypermetabolism between migraine attacks, uh, ATP being reduced as much as 20% on average and some have shown increased lactate, which is also a marker for mitochondrial dysfunction. Then we have peripheral blood studies where people showed that oxidative and nitros nitrosative, another form of stress, is increased in migraine patients or markers of those. And, and also the antioxidant capacity in migraine seems to be reduced. So whenever there's a mismatch between uh, the reactive oxid oxygen species and then uh, the antioxidant capacity, so those guys that try and catch the oxidative stress and make it neutral so it doesn't do any harm. When there's an unbalance uh, and the, the oxidative stress is higher than the antioxidant capacity, then we have the damage. And that seems to be reduced in migraine also, which could be genetic, for example. Okay, and then we have very early studies that have used glucose, oral glucose tolerance tests to determine whether migraines are actually glucose intolerant, I would say. And this is very interesting. So if you give just pure glucose, like something between 50 and 100 grams to a migraine patient, a few things happen. First of all, early studies have shown that about 50% of migraineurs that get an oral glucose tolerance test on an empty stomach fasted in the morning will develop a migraine in the over 50% in the following eight hours and sometimes even in four hours after. So glucose is able to directly trigger a migraine attack. This could be, for example, due to increased oxidative stress but then they also found other things. So in some migraine patients, they developed something called a reactive hypoglycemia. So they released too much insulin in a delayed fashion so that their glucose went lower than normal. And again, you'll have some sort of hypometabolism or an energy deficit in the brain. And then this is the most interesting finding. When they used these glucose oral glucose tolerance tests in migraine patients, and they looked at the differential response between those that got an attack and those that didn't, they found that fatty acids, free fatty acids, and ketone bodies actually increased in those that got a migraine attack despite eating the same food and getting the same amount of glucose. They actually got into ketosis 
And this really, I mean, thinking about it, this really can be seen as an adaptive response of the brain, seeing, oh my God, we're low in energy. We can't really get the glucose where we want it to be. Now we have to turn on, we have to rely on other fuels. We have to turn on ketogenesis. We have to ramp up cortisol, which was also always increased to produce a bit more endogenous glucose to supply the brain and also produce ketones. So we can basically um, cover this energy shortage that we're experiencing. And there's another very interesting thing that happened during that time in a lot of the studies or a proportion of the studies and they showed a physiological insulin resistance and insulin resistance findings in migraines have been mixed some studies have been associating insulin resistance with migraine and others not but if we look at insulin resistance as an example of another adaptive response originally an evolutionary advantage right Insulin resistance, actually, if you think about it, 10,000 years ago was a very good thing. Insulin resistance was needed when we were in a ketotic state, right? When energy was scarce or at least carbohydrate availability was very, very low. So insulin resistance basically means that the muscles and the fat cells sometimes, especially the muscles, get resistant to the insulin signal. So that means that they will, despite insulin being present, not open their doors as much and take as much glucose in. Now, why would this be adaptive? Well, in a carbohydrate deprived animal, right, organism, it makes sense to conserve the glucose that we produce or that is available for organs or tissues that cannot really metabolize fatty acids or proteins very well. And the number one organ being is the brain. So in order to make sure that the brain gets sufficient energy during a carbohydrate deprived state, is one of the mechanisms is insulin resistance. It's completely natural. Now, in nowadays, this adaptive mechanism basically is not so adaptive anymore if it happens in an individual that is eating carbohydrates all the time and it's a protective mechanism of the muscle because the cells say, we can't take any more glucose, we're not gonna let it in. But physiological insulin resistance is very useful and there's another scenario in nature where this is the case and that's gestational diabetes it's insulin resistance in a mother again if you think about 10,000 years a pregnant woman walking around it's probably good if the glucose she does produce goes to the fetus first so the baby does need glucose for development so in terms in times of scarcity it's probably good if the mother turns insulin resistant so the baby gets enough glucose so insulin resistance is an adaptive response that nowadays, because our environment has changed, is turning maladaptive. And I think in migraine, the insulin resistance could be a protective mechanism, and we'll come back to that later. Okay, then we find reduced glucagon um, sensitivity, which I think I mentioned briefly last time, which is glucagon is the um, basically the opposite of insulin, it's the hormone that is produced during fasting and is needed to turn on uh, gluconeogenesis and keto, uh, ketogenesis, producing ketone bodies in terms of fasting. And if you're not very sensitive to that, then obviously you won't produce as much energy during times of fasting. And such patients might be more prone to migraine attack when they skip a meal, for example, when they fast. Okay. And also decreased leptin has been found, which is the hunger hormone. So again, that will make sense. But uh, these findings are really not, really not uh, well established. And there's another study that shows the opposite. So we don't really know right now what is the case. Then we have genetic studies. And genetic studies have focused a lot on mitochondrial DNA and traditional mutations such as in MELAS, a mitochondriopath mitochondriopathy. I'm not sure how you pronounce that in English. Uh, a mitochondrial disease, right? A classic mitochondrial disease. And those MELAS mutations of those classical mitochondrial diseases have not been found in migraine. But on the other hand, if you look at those mitochondrial diseases, a large proportion of those have migraine, right? And um, so there is an association, but the traditional mutation in MELAS is probably not found in migraine. But again, it also makes sense. Otherwise, all migraine patients might have that MELAS disease, right? What we do find is in GVAS, we find that, that mitochondrial DNA clusters in given regions in the brain with a gene expression analysis or with, um, with other genetic tools, we find that there is mitochondrial DNA does seem to, or genes 
polymorphism, common polymorphisms are associated with migraine that do cluster in areas of the brain and in, in functional modules, let's say, that play a role in mitochondrial functioning. And then we have um, associations with migraine with SOD2, which is an antioxidant enzyme, basically, that is uh, mutated in migraine or has been found mutated, which must make sense. And then we find some mutations in nuclear DNA that controls, that produces mitochondrial proteins. So this has also recently been found. And I think there's a quite a few genetic evidences, um, soft evidence that migraine and metabolic function or mitochondrial dysfunction play a role in migraine. And lastly, um, what kind of therapeutic evidence do we have, right? There's cortisol. Cortisol is used acutely to treat migraine, so um, hydrocortisone helps. Cortisol, we know, does increase gluconeogenesis. And caffeine is also used, coffee, as an acute uh, natural uh, alternative migraine treatment. And again, caffeine stimulates cortisol, which, co which stimulates gluconeogenesis, just as a potential mechanism. And I think it also increases fatty acid, uh, free fatty acid levels, and even ketogenesis. So these are potential pathways where acute treatment could could help. And then in terms of prophylactic treatment, we know that a lot of nutraceuticals that we give to treat migraines like magnesium, riboflavin, coenzyme Q10, alpha lipoic acid, B vitamins, and the ketogenic diet also recently, they all impact mitochondrial functioning positively, especially if there's a lack in some sort of uh, nutrients um, around that are involved in mitochondrial functioning of some sort. Okay, but then also, uh, a lot of the pharmacological agents we find now that they have a protective effect on mitochondria. For example, topiramate, an antiepileptic drug, does influence mitochondrial functioning, impacts the mitochondria positively. And this is the clinical data. Now we'll have a very brief look on experimental data because this could really help us support the hypothesis that migraine could potentially be um, an an adaptive response, a compensatory response of an energy deprived brain and it might help us highlight the mechanisms of how this works. So basically um, the correlate of an aura is something called a cortical spreading depression which is a phenomenon where an electrical wave of activity basically goes typically on your occipital lobe, the back of your brain where your vision is involved and it just spreads and leaves a depression behind it, right? And um, this basically then correlates with this, um, with this problems in, in vision, right? This uh, black areas in your visual field, which is called an, an aura, a visual aura. Okay, and this is often used in, in animal models of migraine to see what triggers a migraine or yeah, what are the mechanisms behind this. And so hypoglycemia and hypoxia really reduce the threshold experimentally to induce this cortical spreading depression in mice or rats. And so we know, meanwhile, that the physiological correlate of, uh, the, of the migraine pain is the activation of the trigeminal vascular system, which runs, runs around here, right? Your trigeminal nerve um, innervates the, uh, the, this part of the brain. And um, we also know that CGRP, it's not important what it's called, but you might have heard it from the new migraine vaccinations, these CGRP antagonists that CGRP is a, it's a neuropeptide or a peptide in the body that is involved in pain transmission. And really when this peptide is released, it, acti it activates the system and that just hurts. So we know that the physiological correlate of the migraine pain is this CGRP release. Now, interestingly, there has been quite a lot of research already published about CGRP and what it does in the body. And we find that it's not migraine specific, it's also released in other conditions of chronic pain. And it's an antioxidant. It has anti-inflammatory actions. It increases glucose levels. It causes physiological insulin resistance. And because it hurts, it really enforces these energy conserving behaviors. It makes you sick, you know, all this noise, light sensitivity really triggers you to withdraw and save energy basically until energy homeostasis is restored in the brain. Unless you take tryptans or potent painkillers, in which case you just move about again. So 
really, one could argue that the, the cascade of events in migraine, the trigger factors that increase oxidative stress, oxidative stress activating this trigeminal vascular system, leading to the release of CGRP, CGRP then reducing the oxidative stress levels, increasing gluconeogenesis, right, leading to insulin resistance, which basically in this case leads to increased glucose availability for for the brain, right? And at the same time, reducing the energy that the organism or the animal spends. One could really say that this is an adaptive response. It's a counter-regulatory response to an energy deficit or increased oxidative stress in the brain, which can really be dangerous. So migraine might not be a disease. Migraine might be a brain state that has been saving humans from the bad consequences of energy deficit in the brain and increased oxidative stress levels. So this basically is a take-home message from the review. And uh, I think from this it already brings some therapeutic advantages that I would love to um, summarize before, before basically ending, ending this next talk. Okay, so basically to ensure migraines have been associated with decreased mitochondrial functioning, which means that if we want to avoid the migraines and the damages of oxidative stress, we really need to make sure that the mitochondria we have have the best possible environment to thrive in, to give us the energy that we need. So the first thing that comes from this is I think individualized supplementation of micronutrients might be a good thing if we actually test in the lab that we have a lack in some of the vitamins, coenzymes, nutrients, minerals that we need for proper mitochondrial functioning, if we have a lack there, then it's much more probable that things won't work as smoothly. So individualized supplementation is the first thing. Then I guess in a migraine prone or mitochondrial dysfunction prone organism, it's good to reduce oxidative stress and at the same time increase antioxidants. Now, you know from my last talk that beta-hydroxybutyrate 1 ketone body is a very potent antioxidant. So this is already good. And if we burn it instead of other fuels, then it also cre creates less oxidative, reactive oxidative species per ATP produced, basically. And then I would always say, you know, a clean diet, not too many processed foods, which cause oxidative stress again, a nutrient-dense diet, possibly low-carb, right? less high glycemic foods because again that increases oxidative stress right less alcohol i'm afraid because it also increases oxidative stress and is a poison that needs to be metabolized by the liver until we can uh, produce energy again then uh, maybe the use of um, green glasses or blue light blockers because blue light again increases oxidative stress in the retina and also in other parts of the body throughout skin actually um, stopping hormone-based contraception of course that means you need to uh, do something else, but uh, for some migraine patients it can be really a relief. Um, adding other antioxidants, polyphenols, coenzyme Q10, alpha lipoic acid, uh, maybe even exogenous ketones at some points might help. And then also I think there's more and more good lab tests available where you can actually measure a potential mismatch between oxidative stress and antioxidant capacity, so this might be helpful. And then another thing where also low carb diets and keto or ketogenic diets even come into the picture is we want to stabilize blood glucose. We don't want to go into hypoglycemic states because this is again where the migraine gets triggered as a preventative or a protective mechanism. So just don't get there. If you don't want to get there, you will benefit from low um, insulinic foods, uh, low GI foods, right? Or even ketogenic foods, low carb, because then your blood sugar won't fluctuate as much, which that will uh, ensure a constant energy supply of the brain and lead to less, uh, yeah, less oxidative stress in, in the long run also. I think all of you know what is meant by a low GI or low um, carb diet or ketogenic diet, so I won't get into those details. And for more severely affected patients where really glucose metabolism or even transport is even further compromised, mitochondrial functioning of some of the complexes in, in the mitochondrial energy production chain, let's say, is further genetically damaged or epigenetically damaged. Those people might really depend on an alternative energy substrate of the brain. 
So far, we've been trying to stabilize blood glucose, giving the mitochondria all the micronutrients they need, right? But we also might too actually have to be in ketosis if we're a chronic migraine patient, at least for some parts. So I've been in strict ketosis for two years, two and a half years. And after that, really, for me now, a low GI, low carb diet is totally fine without my attack threshold being increased. So some of the effects that you might get from staying in ketosis for a long time will actually outlast or are likely to outlast the duration of ketosis. And then a cyclical keto ketosis uh, approach might be completely sufficient or maybe even just low carb. So if you need to provide the brain with an alternative energy substrate, then a ketogenic diet that can be enhanced with MCTs or potent potentially exogenous ketones, depending on how high your threshold needs to be, um, can really be beneficial. And uh, yeah, I think um, we've talked about the four therapeutic steps that we can take. We've talked about how migraine triggers can actually lead to the migraine brain and that this could be of adaptive advantage and how even insulin resistance, which is now uh, considered completely a bad thing, one day probably had an adaptive advantage. And um, I hope you now understand better what a migraine is, uh, that a migraine is not something nasty in the sense that our brain is trying to um, do us, uh, uh, yeah, trying to trick us or do a bad thing with us. It's actually trying to protect us from something that has happened before. So the migraines are just a consequence of a bad thing that we can't really see or feel, which is hypoglycemia or too much oxidative stress. And if we try to prevent the hypermetabolism in the brain, so the energy deficit in the brain or the high oxidative stress, I think we can really, really reduce the migraine frequency, the, increase the migraine threshold that it might take. And uh, you might get your life back like me just by following uh, these steps. So as always, if you have any questions, please post them below the video down here and I will try and get to answer them as soon as possible. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was useful and uh, I'll see you again next time. Bye bye.